Welcome to Prescription for Justice. My name is Martin Donahue. Today's topic is global warming. Chief Seattle famously said, the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. The earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Well, the web is fraying and our mother is dying. Global warming is a scientific fact, is getting worse, and is destroying the planet's web of life, sickening and killing people, and costing trillions of dollars. Global warming occurs consequent to the burning of fossil fuels, which release carbon dioxide and methane. These compounds, along with nitrous oxide and sulfur oxides, contribute to a greenhouse effect, wherein the sun's heat radiation becomes trapped, raising temperatures worldwide. There has been a 30% increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide since industrialization began. 80% of current carbon emissions come from burning fossil fuels, that is coal, oil, and natural gas. The other 20% result from deforestation, melting of permafrost, agriculture, and other phenomena. Overall energy use has nearly doubled in the last 30 plus years. Thus, fossil fuel use has also nearly doubled. Our atmosphere now contains 415 parts per million carbon dioxide, up from 280 parts per million in the pre-industrial era. Anything over 350 parts per million is considered dangerous. Carbon dioxide is currently being released at almost twice the rate it is being removed by plants and absorbed by the oceans. Today, the top one-fifth of the world's largest 145 countries account for 63% of global carbon dioxide emissions, while the lowest one-fifth account for just 2%. The U.S. accounts for 23 tons per person per year versus a global average of just 5.4 tons per person per year. Unfairly, the countries likely to be most affected by global warming are those least responsible for increases in global temperature. The last five years have been the hottest ever recorded based on data going back to 1856. Worldwide average temperature increased by 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit between 1901 and 2012 and continues to rise. The Arctic and the Pacific Northwest are warming faster than other parts of the planet. Temperatures are way beyond what they have been for at least 10,000 years. Some scientists estimate that if current trends continue, we will see a global temperature increase of between 4.5 and 9 degrees Celsius by 2100. If all identified fossil fuels on the planet were burned, that is, the 5.5 trillion tons of oil, coal, and natural gas now underground, the Earth could heat up by as much as 18 degrees. And while climate cycles and temperature variations have occurred throughout history, they have occurred on geological timescales of many thousands to millions of years, and even then wrought catastrophic consequences for life on Earth. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Environment Program estimate that global warming causes at least 400,000 deaths worldwide annually. This number is expected to double by 2030. Furthermore, in addition to heart and lung disease and a variety of cancers, air pollution from fossil fuels causes between 100,000 and 200,000 premature deaths per year in the U.S over 500,000 in the European Union and 7 million worldwide, although half of these are due to indoor cooking fires in poor nations. Global warming also leads to increased weather extremes and natural disasters, including megafires, drought, and severe floods. There were over 71,000 wildfires in the U.S. in 2017, burning 10 million acres and destroying thousands of homes. Megafires, which burn over 100,000 acres, occurred less than once per year in the U.S. prior to 1995. Between 2007 and 2017, there were an average of 10 per year. The western U.S. wildfire season lasts at least two and a half months longer today than in the early 1970s. Worldwide, over 330,000 people die annually from the after effects of wildfires. Following such fires, forests do not recover quickly, and some areas may be permanently replaced by grasslands and shrublands. Compounding the problem, 
rising temperatures increase smog and ground level ozone, which stunts plant growth. Deadly heat waves both here and abroad have roasted the planet, including a 2003 European heat wave which caused up to 70,000 premature deaths, and one affecting Moscow in 2010 which killed about 10,000. Meanwhile, floods and hurricanes are getting bigger, and the National Flood Insurance Program is phasing out flood insurance, as it is $24 billion in debt and unable to pay off existing Hurricane Katrina and Sandy claims. Outside the United States, increased flooding has contributed to homelessness, climate refugees, and cholera outbreaks. Globally, natural disasters make 14 million people homeless each year. This number will increase dramatically. 13 of the world's 20 largest cities are coastal. One third of the world's population lives within 60 miles of a shoreline. As sea levels rise in the absence of multi-trillion dollar mega engineering projects, Cities like New York, Miami, and many others will need to relocate and rebuild. Already, Indonesia plans to move its capital city away from Jakarta, which is sinking. The island of Kiribati is expected to disappear by 2050. Other areas at high risk of submersion are Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Kivalina in Alaska, and Male in the Maldives. Higher temperatures lead to the expansion of water, along with melting of the polar ice caps, glaciers, and the Greenland ice sheet, as well as the greenhouse gas-laden permafrost, all of which results in a positive feedback loop of runaway temperatures. Sea levels have risen 10 inches since the late 19th century and could rise another three feet at least over the 21st century. The Arctic ice pact has lost 40% of its thickness compared with 1960. The West Antarctic ice sheet is undergoing irreversible collapse, and nearly 1,000 icebergs are currently drifting south of the 48th parallel, threatening oil platforms and ships. Great Lakes ice coverage is down 71% over the last 40 years. Glacier National Park will likely require a name change before the end of the century. And the fabled snows of Kilimanjaro have shrunk 85% since 1912 and may be gone within the next 10 years. Arctic and boreal forests are warming twice as fast as other parts of the world. Beaches are losing so much sand to erosion that there is a global black market in sand to support the construction industry. Beach resorts and ski chalets are suffering significant economic losses. Global wine production has decreased and wine regions are in flux affecting both small and large-scale operations. As global temperatures rise, the geographic region subject to various infectious diseases expands, leading to more cases of malaria and other tick and mosquito-borne viruses, such as dengue fever, yellow fever, and eastern equine encephalitis. Permafrost and tundra melting could lead to outbreaks of anthrax, whose spores can lie dormant for decades as well as a possible resurgence of the 1918 Spanish flu virus. Higher levels of carbon dioxide favor growth of ragweed and other pollen-producing plants, thus worsening seasonal allergies and asthma. Global warming also contributes to species loss, with current extinction rates 1,000 times the normal background rate. Rising carbon dioxide levels acidify the ocean, destroying plankton, the basis of the ocean's complex food chain which affects all ocean creatures. Corals and kelp forests are dying. Oysters, useful for filtering water, are disappearing. Jellyfish, the cockroaches of the sea, are flourishing. While habitat loss, a consequence of overpopulation and deforestation, is currently the number one contributor to non-aquatic species loss, global warming, currently the number two cause, is expected to overtake it by 2050. The World Health Organization calls global warming the greatest threat to human health this century. The Pentagon calls it an immediate threat to national security. Countries that export oil are more than 40 times as likely to be engaged in civil war than those that do not. The desire to keep oil flowing played a significant role in the first two Gulf Wars, not to mention the enormous military subsidies we donate to countries in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia and Egypt functional dictatorships, and sites of extensive human and women's rights violations. Incidentally, researchers have also noted that a one degree rise in average temperatures is associated with a 3% increase in violent crime. 
The petroleum industry continues to rack up record-breaking profits, in part due to mergers squelching competition. The most profitable corporation in 2018, by far, was the Saudi company Aramco, with an astoundingly egregious $111 billion in profit. In 2016, three of the world's 10 most profitable corporations were oil companies. Exxon made $34 billion that year and an obscene $45 billion in profit in 2008, which at that time was the largest profit in U.S. history and exceeded the gross domestic product of the bottom two-thirds of the world's nations. The fossil fuel industry's strategy mirrors that of the tobacco industry, which for decades denied and then minimized the serious risks of smoking. Exxon and other oil companies have influenced public policy and confused the general public through advertising and public relations campaigns, support of corporate front groups, and funding of a few lapdog scientists who, contrary to the 99 plus percent of climate scientists who agree that global warming is unprecedented and man-made, continue to insist otherwise. Representatives from one group, the American Council on Science and Health, are frequently quoted in the mainstream press, despite holding a variety of anti-science debunked opinions related to environmental science. Their former long-standing executive director spent time in prison for Medicaid fraud, perjury, and obstruction of justice. The group referred to the belief that burning fossil fuels has caused global warming as a pseudoscience and has criticized environmental scientists as doomsayers and fear mongers. With US public education in disarray and our test scores among the lowest in the industrialized world, polluting industries have sponsored environmental education programs, which cash-strapped schools have adopted, such as Exxon's Energy Cube, which contains correct but deliberately obfuscating statements like, gasoline is simply solar power hidden in decayed matter, and offshore drilling creates artificial reefs for fish. International Papers curriculum states, clear cutting promotes growth of trees that require full sunlight and allows efficient site preparation for the next crop. The American Coal Foundation's fourth grade lesson packet, published by Scholastic and entitled The United States of Energy, omits mention of toxic waste, mountaintop removal, and greenhouse gases. Just over a decade ago, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists awarded its notable achievement in journalism prize to Michael Crichton for his novel State of Fear, which denies global warming. Perhaps not surprisingly, only 50 to 70 percent of U.S. citizens believe in human-caused global warming, giving us the lowest in level of environmental awareness on the planet. Anti-science legislators call global warming a hoax, one perpetrated by the Chinese, according to our current president. Energy Secretary Rick Perry, who once promised to eliminate the agency he now heads, claimed that so climate scientists manufactured a crisis as part of a conspiracy to obtain research funding. And the proudly and profoundly ignorant Republican Senator James Imhoff, who cannot understand the difference between weather and climate, once brought a snowball to the Senate floor to argue that because it was snowing in February, climate change could not be real. Imhoff, who receives substantial financial contributions from the oil industry, has also blamed Hollywood elites and the United Nations for promoting the myth of global warming. In 2004, the highly respected journal Science published an article examining coverage of global warming in the scientific and mainstream news media over the preceding decade. They found that of 928 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, none were in doubt as to the existence or cause of global warming. On the other hand, of 636 articles in the country's four leading newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and Wall Street Journal, 53% expressed some doubt as to the existence and primary cause of global warming. This was likely due to journalists with limited scientific training and to the desire to appear fair and balanced. Worldwide annual fossil fuel subsidies range between $775 billion and $1 trillion, an amount that varies based on oil prices. This does not include the other costs of fossil fuels related to climate change, health and environmental impacts, and military spending. 
including such externalities, the unpaid costs of fossil fuels are upward of $5.3 trillion annually, or $10 million per minute. If all benefits and subsidies were stopped, 1.6 million preventable deaths per year would be averted. To put it bluntly, our tax money funds a carnage of genocidal proportions. The fossil fuel industry wields significant power. Oil, gas, and coal companies spent $354 million in campaign contributions and lobbying and received $29 billion in federal subsidies over the 2016 election cycle, a spectacular 8,200% return on their investment. While a decade ago the industry argued that further extraction of fuels was necessary due to our dependence on foreign oil, the U.S. is currently a net oil exporter, rendering this argument implausible. Rather, industry's goal is to get fossil fuels out of the ground as quickly as possible in order to amass enormous profits. Indeed, making money is the raison d'etre of corporations. Noam Chomsky reminds us, corporations have no moral conscience. They are designed by law to be concerned only for their stockholders and not, say, what are sometimes called their stakeholders, like the community or the workforce. Conservative economist Milton Friedman cynically expanded upon this truism, stating, the only social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. Corporations, while internalizing profits for their shareholders and paying their CEOs exorbitant salaries, externalize the trillions of dollars of health care and environmental expenditures consequent to global warming and air pollution to taxpayers of this and future generations. Thus, any solution to climate change must involve holding corporations accountable for their actions and returning power to the people, especially those suffering most from such actions, which is usually the poor, women, and racial and ethnic minorities. Unfortunately, our current pro-business president is a narcissistic, sociopathic, xenophobic, racist, ignorant, anti-science, misogynistic, admitted sex offender, and sexual predator who represents a national security risk and has acknowledged asking adversarial governments to interfere in our elections. But for purposes of this episode, he is aggressively ecocidal. Trump strongly and irresponsibly supports coal and natural gas development and fracking and has expanded drilling areas. Today, more than 17 million U.S. citizens live within one mile of an active oil or natural gas well. Two and a half million abandoned oil and gas wells litter our country, with 20 to 30 million worldwide polluting their surroundings, which often includes local water supplies, and carrying the risk of explosion. Between 2000 and 2017, the nation's natural gas network leaked 17.6 billion cubic feet of mostly methane gas, taking nearly 100 lives, injuring close to 500 people, forcing the evacuation of thousands, and costing $1.1 billion. Pipeline leaks and bursts happen more often than once a day. Trump's de facto science advisor is Michael Kratzios, a 31-year-old with a political science degree and no scientific training. Trump appointed Robert Phelan, who said that children need to breathe dirty air to strengthen their lungs, to a scientific advisory board. The president's former Environmental Protection Agency head, Scott Pruitt, was an anti-regulatory zealot who resigned under a cloud of ethics scandals. Pruitt's EPA overturned Obama's Clean Power Plan, which would have required power plants to reduce carbon emissions by 32 percent from 2005 levels by 2030, thereby preventing 3,600 premature deaths. Current EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler, a former coal lobbyist, has promised to rewrite pollution rules for coal plants. <clears throat> He overturned the stream protection rule, removing restrictions on coal companies dumping ash and mine waste into waterways, and defunded a health study of coal mining communities. Trump has halted Obama-era rules designed to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas drilling and postponed more aggressive miles per gallon requirements for new cars and trucks. Trump's lapdog agency heads have demoralized government scientists by silencing them and have suppressed scientific studies thus damaging these agencies' credibility and discouraging young scientists from wanting to enter public service. 
By an extremely conservative estimate, research published over one year ago in the prestigious journal JAMA calculated that Trump's anti-environmental agenda would lead to 80,000 extra deaths per decade and respiratory problems for more than one million people. An updated Trump death counter showing in real time the loss of life consequent to his destructive policies is sorely needed. Enough data already exist for an enterprising scientist and or activist to create an ongoing tabulation. Outside of the risks to humanity of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction, there is no greater threat to human health or the stability of the planet than climate change. The current generation has caused this problem and failed to solve it. We are all guilty to varying degrees, whether through our personal habits, our support of unengaged and anti-science legislators, even our failure to raise our voices loud enough to demand immediate, massive changes to global energy policy and consumption. The health, environmental, and economic consequences of the potentially unrecognizable world we are leaving to our children and grandchildren will be especially and epically disastrous. Fortunately, there is some good news. The United Nations International Panel on Climate Change and former vice president and author of An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore, shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. The World Bank will no longer finance oil and gas projects after this year, and as of last year, more than half of all U.S. coal plants have closed or are committed to retiring. Ireland plans to divest of all fossil fuels. France will ban all oil and gas production by 2040, and New York City is suing the top five oil companies for their role in climate change and divesting itself of billions of dollars in fossil fuel investments. A group of American teenagers has brought a federal lawsuit under the public trust doctrine, accusing government of violating its duty to protect future generations from climate change. This case is currently held up in circuit court, but may one day reach the Supreme Court. There are over 1,100 lawsuits invoking climate change worldwide, including almost 900 in the United States. The Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change calls on nations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions based on the scientific consensus that global warming is occurring and that it is extremely likely that human-made CO2 emissions have predominantly caused it. Short-sightedly, the United States does not support this agreement. The 2017 Paris Climate Agreement commits signatories to limiting global warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, a number necessary to avoid a planet-wide ecological and humanitarian disaster. After winning the Electoral College, but not the popular vote, and becoming president, Donald Trump withdrew the U.S. from the agreement, leaving it the only country opposed. The future does not have to bring an apocalyptic hellscape. The problem of climate change is solvable with enough brain power and money along with social and political will. If our country could harness the brain power and money to send men to our moon 240,000 miles away and revolving around our planet at 2,800 miles per hour and then return them safely to Earth, which itself rotates at 1,000 miles per hour while speeding around the sun at 18 miles per second, we can certainly reverse climate change. It will involve increased public education, elimination of fossil fuel subsidies, a shift to a green economy, part of the Green New Deal, and major changes in our transportation and consumption habits. Clean energy jobs pay better and are less dangerous than fossil fuel sector jobs. Not to minimize the consequences for those working in fossil fuels who might require some retraining for clean energy jobs, there are 25% more professional dancers and almost five times as many professional bowlers as coal miners in the United States. But yet these professions have not been aggressively courted by President Trump. The costs of solar, wind, and hydropower are coming down, and when subsidies and externalities are taken into account, renewables look great. Indeed, the inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, said in 1931, I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. And while some support increasing nuclear power, which they claim is safe, costs are prohibitive, accidents still possible, as we saw in Japan in 2011, and safe, long-lasting storage of radioactive waste cannot be guaranteed. I personally support nuclear power, but only the kind that generates solar energy and is created 93 million miles away in the sun. 
Many of us have been inspired by courageous 16-year-old activist Greta Thunberg, who has bluntly conf confronted world leaders, blaming them for their inaction. Her passionate, righteous anger has helped to agitate young people worldwide. Thunberg has adopted the mantra of activist Angela Davis, who said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Protests and individual and group lobbying of recalcitrant legislators at the local, state, and national level can make a difference. Finally, it is incumbent upon all of us to demand change and to hold our government accountable. For as Edward R. Murrow warned, a nation of sheep will beget a government of wolves. We must not underestimate the power of citizens to affect revolutionary change. Remarkably, our nation's low voter turnout ranks in the bottom one quarter compared with other democratic countries. Furthermore, the rich vote more often than the poor, whites more than ethnic minorities, and the elderly more than young people, although this has begun to change. Award-winning writer Alice Walker wrote, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. So please, educate yourself and vote in every election. When you vote, ask yourself, not just how a particular candidate or initiative will benefit you, but how your vote might benefit your community, your country, the world, and future generations. Each vote you cast helps to determine your legacy. For further information on global warming, see the environmental health page of the Public Health and Social Justice website where you can also find suggestions on what you can do to minimize your own carbon footprint along with how to become more involved, since after all, there is strength in numbers. Please also join us next month when Dr. Kristen Dahl from the Union of Concerned Scientists joins me to talk more about global warming, especially weather extremes, sea level rise, and what we can do as individuals and as a society to prevent runaway climate change. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Martin Donahue. This has been Prescription for Justice. <music>